Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining today for today's Tuesday topic, something I think is really important and relatively controversial, and that is push dose vasopressors, pros and cons, and really having an understanding of what they are, why we do it, how we should be doing it, how it should be mixed, who should mix it, and do you have a policy? So first and foremost, I'm gonna start with a simple case study. Uh, patients are unstable and time is of the essence. So we have a 70 year old, 70 kilogram male, presents to the ED, maybe he's in flight, maybe you're transporting, but he has a return of spontaneous circulation after a suspected STEMI and a cardiac arrest. He got CPR for about five minutes, got one dose of epinephrine, via IO, and he was intubated by paramedics. EKG is positive for an inferior MI. Paramedics say blood pressure that we measured was 110 over 60, and his heart rate was 60. He's looking pretty darn good. <clears throat> but as he get, comes through triage and is admitted into your resuscitation room, you're performing your initial evaluation. Cardiology comes. He says, hey, uh, things don't look that great. By the way, I'm looking up at the Dynamap, and it says that the blood pressure is 90 over 40 and his heart rate's 49. We're going to go to the cath lab in five minutes, but I'm afraid this patient is going to again have a cardiac arrest. You check for a pulse, you've got one, but both of you are concerned that the patient is rapidly deteriorating and decompensating. And so cardiology says, let's start a vasopressor. Maybe we should start norepinephrine. But you don't have norepinephrine ready mixed in your uh, in your Pixis or in your code card. And you say, I've got to order it from pharmacy and it might, ten, might take 10 to 15 minutes to arrive. And you as the bedside provider say, hmm, is there something I can give now while I'm waiting for the norepinephrine? And why would I ever even consider that? And for many of you who know me well, I believe that we should always address the causative problem and that blood pressure management in general is a symptom management device. Doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It just means we need to be cautious when we introduce vasopressors. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about push dose then. And why would we consider, what might we consider with a push dose delivery? Okay, excuse me for uh, my long COVID symptoms of dry throat. Okay, so what are push doses? Push doses are small intermittent, intermittent. So you might give five or eight doses of vasopressors to optimize your patient's hemodynamics and to stabilize them until you can resuscitate with fluids and or vasopressors and or inotropes. It is not meant to be a long-standing therapeutic intervention, just during a window of time when your patient's blood pressure is dangerously low and where they may actually exacerbate or extend a myocardial or cerebral infarct. Now, we all know, any of us who've been in critical care for any time, we know that this is a long-standing methodology that anesthesiologists use. They bring a patient from the OR who's lost three units or three liters of fluid and blood. They've gotten a lot of fluid, a lot of blood. They're in shock. And all the way that they're traveling from the OR to the ICU, they're pushing neosinephrine. Now, I think for years, bedside nurses thought they're just trying to fool us. They're pushing neosinephrine. The patient's blood pressure is fine. Maybe they told you they were pushing Neo, maybe they didn't, and all of a sudden your patient's pressure bottoms out. And of course, that is a main consideration when we talk about push dose vasopressor is that we treat the blood pressure in the moment, but you may have rebound, profound rebound hypotension after push dose therapy, especially if you've done it more than twice, more than likely that that patient is going to need a continuous strip. But we do know that from a research perspective, from an evidence-based perspective and a vetted perspective, push dose vasopressors uh, for post-anesthesia vasoplesia or hypotension is a common evidence-based practice for anesthesia. Very important. So why would we consider this? Why do we consider it in flight? 
Why do we consider it in the ED? And why are we considering it in the ICU? Uh, one thing for sure is that we know that even two minutes, and it may even be shorter, two minutes of transient hypotension is associated with an increased risk of acute kidney injury, acute myocardial injury, and cerebral injury, and significant increase in poor outcomes. So very important for us to appreciate, first and foremost, whether you do push dose vasopressors or not, you cannot allow your patients to have episodes of hypotension without intervention. That of course lends itself very well to some of the new technologies that are coming forward that are predictive hypotensive algorithms that really tell us patients at risk so we can treat them before they have incidental hypotension since that is associated with poor outcomes. We want to remind ourselves transient hypotension is associated and is a predictor of poor outcomes. So what kinds of things can we rapidly push? So not a big surprise to anybody, phenylephrine, nor is epinephrine a total surprise, but norepinephrine and vasopressin might be a little bit more surprising. They are coming around the horizon. We are having lots of discussions about these therapeutic interventions and doing push dose therapies. But what is really, really important to remember is what these drugs actually do and what the secondary effects can be when you're doing push dose therapy. And also to remind yourself that neosinephrine is neosinephrine and you can push neosinephrine as long as you push the right amount. But when you push dose epinephrine, you typically have had to mix that. And actually it appears that 10% of patients who are getting push dose epinephrine have a human error um, con contributory fact. There's a tenfold increase in dosing error with mixing and administering push dose epinephrine. That makes us all take a deep breath because this can be very concerning. So of recent note, even in my institution, there's been a number of push dose therapies, some that have worked out very well, some that actually were very injurious because of dosing issues. So we always have to be aware that that's a possibility. A fantastic article, Human Errors and Adverse Hemodynamic Events Related to Push Dose Pressors in the ED, published in Toxicology in 2019. They said, although the use of small bolus dose of vasopressors termed push dose pressors has become common in emergency medicine, data examining this practice is scant. So we don't really have much evidence. We have some case studies, not even that many case studies, case reports, but not really evidence about how that actually improves outcomes. Now, it might improve the outcome, the primary outcome in the ED, which is the patient didn't die. And that's pretty important, but we don't know how it affects them long-term. Does it extend myocardial infarct? Do they have a cerebral infarct? Do they have problems with blood flow to their fingers and their toes? We don't really know that. What we do know, again, that I mentioned to you before, push dose pressors frequently involve bedside dilution. Bedside dilution can result in errors and adverse events, particularly if it's a crash situation, someone's mixing it who isn't reading the labels, they're reading the label incorrectly on epinephrine, they're mixing it incorrectly, they're administering from a syringe that isn't labeled that the physician has mixed, don't really know what's in it, not really certain, about 10% of patients receiving push dose pressors outside of the OR, 10% have errors. And these human errors and the corresponding adverse hemodynamic events are pretty darn common with the use of push dose vasopressors. So first and foremost, I'm going to tell you, you I'm just sharing my opinion here, my opinion. My opinion is Hypotension is disastrous. And that sometimes you have to fix the hypotension to give you time to figure out what the problem is. So understanding that hypotension is disastrous and that you have to fix that hypotension as quickly as possible, restore as best you can, remember the circulation to your essential oxygen-dependent organs, brain, heart, mesenteric bed, and kidney, 
the tubules of the kidney, you may have to use a dose of vasopressors that you might not normally use in order to restore your patient to blood flow dynamic to those oxygen requiring organs. It's really short term. We don't want to continue it long term. So in that vein, even though in general, I feel we use vasopressors too aggressively and without consideration, in that vein, this may be very helpful, but we have to consider how we should be able to do that safely. So I'm gonna tell you here, I'm gonna tell you now, right now, everybody listening to me, if you work at Grady Hospital, you do not have a protocol, you do not have a methodology, and you do not have protection for administering push dose vasopressors. Make sure you've heard me. You don't have a policy, don't have a protocol, and you are not protected if you give push dose vasopressors. Now, having said that, is it possibly a good idea? Possibly it is. And I have uh, actually initiated a small group to have some discussion about how we can do that safely. Now, from my point of view, the way to do it safely is to have a bolus dose on your pump so that you're actually giving patients a measured dose of drug that's been approved, that's well-managed, that you just put bolus. And that bolus would be with those agents that your hospital committee has agreed to give as bolus dosing so that you're not mixing, that you're not pushing. The problem is if you don't have your drip already and it's taking eight to 10 to 12 minutes to get that drip from the pharmacy, does that answer your question? No. So how are we going to safely implement this in our critical care units? So I'm going to share with you four simple case studies. This is uh, from ED, an EM medicine, emergency medicine document that was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017. And it's called Bolus Dose of Epinephrine for Refractory Post-Arrest Hypotension. And I've got four cases here. And you'll see what's really important, right? So here's a 52-year-old man with past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, and AFib, comes to hospital by ambulance after he had witnessed arrest at home. He received five minutes of CPR in the ambulance, and once he's uh, uh, triaged into our CPR room, he receives a milligram of epinephrine, and he has return to spontaneous circulation. After that, his heart rate was 42 beats per minute, and blood pressure was 56 over 30. So you can see when looking at this patient, He's bradycardic and hypotensive. Epinephrine makes perfect sense for him. It'll raise his heart rate, raise his blood pressure. Two for the price of one. Epinephrine is a good agent for him. Neosinephrine is not a good agent for him because neosinephrine doesn't affect your heart rate and it may limit cardiac ejection. But epinephrine is a great drug for him. Okay, so he, got, he, uh, he gets an IV. The IV he had probably in the ED or in the ambulance, he gets one liter, he gets another IV, he gets another 500 of IV fluid, and his blood pressure is still low. He's really not a fluid responder. He's 58 over 28. So now we're going to place a CVC and we've ordered vasopressors, but pharmacy says it's going to take a few minutes. So doc says, I'm going to give him a bolus dose of epinephrine at one mil. That's 10 micrograms, 10 micrograms, a really small amount every minute through his peripheral IV line. So it's a really small dose. It's gonna be flooded through there on the back of a drip that is running at a higher rate, a fluid drip running at a higher rate. And he receives a total of 10 doses, which is 100 micrograms. Heart rate comes up to 80, blood pressure is 102 over 60. Fusions initiated, the bolus dose no longer needed. He's now on norepinephrine. He doesn't need any other help. Could have put him on an IV of continuous epi or continuous norepi. He no longer needs his bolus dose. He goes off to the ICU, has an uneventful recovery, and later he was diagnosed as having a suspected metoprolol overdose. So he had a lot of beta block on board, and you overcame that with that continuous uh, drip and with the bolus dosing of epinephrine. So epinephrine is the choice in somebody who is hypotensive and bradycardic. And we look at the next patient, 68-year-old female with past medical history of throat cancer, recent hospitalization for pneumonia, witnessed arrest at home, 
get CPR from her husband and another 10 minutes of CPR from the paramedics before ROSC was obtained. Once ROSC was obtained, of course, during that period, they had placed a, an endotracheal tube, an intraosseous access, and two bolus doses of one milligram of epi were given. Now, they didn't really have any data on her, but they gave her two bolus doses of one milligram of epi. That was cardiac arrest epi, not really bolus dosing for hypotension. So she got her cardiac arrest epi, comes to the hospital. She's got a heart rate of 108 and a blood pressure of 62 over 34. She gets a liter of normal saline through her IO. Peripheral IV was obtained, spider fluids, blood pressure was low. After the IV was placed, the patient received one ml of 10 mics of a bolus dose of epi every minute for a total of 12 doses while the central line was placed and norepi infusion was being sent from the pharmacy. Now, because of her epi dosing, her blood pressure improved to 106 over 72. And basically her vital signs stayed relatively stable. Now I'm gonna mention something here. From my point of view, I would never give that patient, I would never have given that patient a bolus, a vasopressor, push dose, epinephrine. And why not? Because her heart rate is already 108. So I will just say of note in the reporting of this case study in this article, they didn't talk about the effect on her heart rate. They just talked about the effect on her blood pressure. They didn't say, oh, we gave her epi and then her heart rate was 110 or 120 or 130 or 140, but her blood pressure had improved. No, she would be a person that in an in algorithmic approach would get push dose vasopressor, either vasopressin, norepinephrine or neosinephrine. Not epinephrine because she was already mildly, even though I don't, I know you don't really consider that, she's already mildly tachycardic. Her heart rate is greater than 100. Don't want to give her epinephrine. That's not going to really benefit her. So she'd be a candidate for bolus dose neo. In this case, they gave her epi, they got her pressure up, but then they found out that the, pa the patient actually was a DNR. So they extubated and the patient died shortly thereafter. 71 year old, case number three. 71 year old with past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, end stage renal disease, receives hemodialysis. He has left foot osteomyelitis presented uh, today in a cardiac arrest. CPR is initiated. These are all CPR patients. Receives four one milligram doses of epi. That's his cardiac dosing, as well as multiple doses of calcium gluconate, sodium bicarbonate, magnesium, because there was concern that he might be in a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest has renal failure, he must have missed one of his hemodialyses, and there was a lot of concern that he might have a hyperkalemic arrest. Now, they achieve ROSC, and his post-ROSC heart rate was 62, and blood pressure 64 over 38. He gets more calcium gluconate and bicarb, he gets albuterol, insulin, glucose, all to protect him from hyperkalemia, while post-arrest labs are in progress. So assuming that he has a hyperkalemic arrest and treating all of that, he gets a fluid bolus that doesn't really change his blood pressure. He gets a central line and a norepinephrine infusion is ordered, but it's going to take some time to get that norepinephrine. So again, a bolus dose of epinephrine is given at one mil. So look at the difference, right? Cardiac arrest epinephrine is one milligram. Bolus dose vasopressor is 10 micrograms every one or two minutes. So he got a total of eight doses, so 80 micrograms. And that helped to improve his blood pressure 106 over 68. Now that's a good choice for him because his heart rate is low. Not such a great choice because of course, epinephrine, honestly for me, one of my concerns is that epinephrine induces insulin resistance and I'm trying to transport uh, glucose, I'm trying to transport potassium into the cell by giving insulin and bicarb and D50 and calcium chloride. Might be kind of concerned about that, but in the moment, all good, all good. So after his arrest, we look at his potassium at 7.8. Everything that was done was perfect, right? He gets transferred to the ICU. He receives emergent dialysis. And later he gets his foot amputated, he gets discharged to a skilled nursing home, and he has no major cognitive deficits. So the two best known push-dose vasopressors 
And that was what the majority of you voted that you gave phenylephrine or epinephrine. You could choose as many as you wanted. People chose either phenylephrine or epinephrine. But when we talk about all of this and the way in which we're gonna be giving this, right? How we're actually administering this to our patients, right? So it's really important to have an appreciation that we're talking about mics per mil here when we're talking about epinephrine. We're talking about mics per mil of phenylephrine, but phenylephrine comes in a phenyl stick. So it makes it a bit easier for you to do the right dosing and the right time of phenylephrine. A little bit harder to do with epinephrine because you're not going to receive an epinephrine push dose vasopressor. You generally have an either anaphylaxis or cardiac arrest epinephrine, and that is way too high of a dose for push dose vasopressor. So very important to remind ourselves about what we can do over here. We can give 50 to 200 mics of neo, 50 to 20 mics of epinephrine, and you can give a dose every two to five minutes. And the onset of action is one minute. Neosinephrine lasts just a tad bit longer, about twice as long actually as epinephrine, really, really, really short term. You're gonna give either one of those push doses if you're giving it, if there's a consideration, and if you have a policy. Don't forget, if you have a policy, you would give epi for hypotension without tachycardia, and you give phenylephrine for hypotension with tachycardia. And you need to define what that means. So common reasons for this, of course, vasodilated shock, vasodilated shock because of sepsis, right? So we, we really think about phenylephrine and how we use phenylephrine the most. The most commonly time we use phenylephrine is with septic shock, with neurogenic shock, and with hemorrhagic shock. And because it's a pure alpha, it doesn't have cardiac effects. So if you've got rapid ventricular response with a cardiac arrest, you could give phenylephrine because it doesn't stimulate that tachycardic response. Epinephrine, of course, is going to create some tachycardia. But we like epinephrine when we're talking about individuals who have bradycardic arrest, patients who have cardiac arrest with ROSC, we should not be given NEO to those patients, only epinephrine for cardiac arrest with ROSC, who we need to bring their pressure up as long as they are not tachycardic. Patients who have anaphylactic shock are also a consideration. So you can see there's not too many differences between these two, except for cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest with return of spontaneous circulation. Those patients will actually be considered for push dose vasopressor with epinephrine. So a couple of things that are important from, from that uh, primary article that looked at pharmacologic differences of push-dose vasopressors, really just reminding us about the differences in these agents, right? These are the agents that are currently under consideration for push-dose. Phenylephrine and epinephrine have been vetted in the OR and do have an evidence base. Norepinephrine, vasopressin, not so much. People are using them, but they are not vetted. There is not significant evidence to support it. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. Doesn't mean it won't work. Doesn't mean it's not right. We just don't have evidence and there's very little policies that we use for these patients. So you can see, again, you're looking at epi, it's alpha, beta one, beta two. So it affects the blood vessels, the heart rate and the contractile function of the myocardium. But you can see significant, as we know, tachycardia. Patient may have a hypertensive event and then become, again, hypotensive after you give their dose. So total dosing typically at one time, five to 20 mics onset one minute, and you can give every five to 10 minutes, okay? Norepinephrine, much less likely for you to use. It is being used by some intensivists as a push-dose vasopressor, alpha and beta-1. So it causes vasoconstriction, it brings the MAP up, but oftentimes what you'll see in lower doses of norepinephrine is some secondary bradycardia. Higher doses of norepinephrine, you'll have tachycardia. You will have hypertension in response, and then you may also then have rebound hypotension and doses three to 10 mics, onset of action less than 60 seconds, and the duration of action is really, really short. So a lot of times if what 
what our physicians might say, I'm gonna use a bolus dose norepinephrine because it's a really short actor. And meanwhile, I want you to titrate upwards, but the patient's blood pressure is really low. So by titrating upwards, I'm not really gonna achieve the effect I need to get the pressure up. So they bolus the patient and then you titrate at the same time you're titrating upwards. So you're saturating the receptor sites and then providing a titrated drip to get that blood pressure up. Vasopressin, don't have much experience with vasopressin. I've given every single one of these except for vasopressin and ephedrine. Ephedrine is only given in the OR because it really has a long life. It's not something that we use outside of the OR and we're not gonna use it outside of the OR. So I'm not really gonna talk about it. It's a great agent in the operating room to combat the effect of vasoplegia post anesthesia. Vasopressin also can act synergistically with the patient's own circulating catecholamines to increase vascular tone and the mean arterial pressure. Very frequently when you give vasopressin as a push dose, your patient will be hypertensive. And as it wears off, you may have some rebound hypotension. So here's how these are recommended for giving. I love this chart. It's so incredibly helpful. So I want you to see here about the epinephrine. Remember that's the 10 mics. So we're not talking about the one milligram. We're talking about micrograms here. And that initial dosing in mil is 0.5 to two mLs. So there are two compounding recommendations, okay? And uh, the thing is we have to consider why you're giving a push dose vasopressor, which is traditionally because you don't have an IV uh, drip bag yet, okay? That's typically why you're gonna do it. So the first compounding is take a 10 ml cc syringe that's got 10 cc's of saline, push out one cc. So now you have nine cc's of saline and into that syringe, put one ml of epinephrine from the 0 0.1 milligram mil cardiac syringe. So that's one milligram per mil, that's 100 micrograms. So you're gonna draw one cc from that 0 0.1 milligram per mil cardiac syringe. That's 100 micrograms. So that means now each cc has 10 micrograms. Now you've got a syringe with 10 micrograms of epinephrine, right? So that makes perfect sense. Or if you have, a vial that you want to pull a milliliter from, from that one milligram per mil vial, not the 0 0.1, that's the cardiac, this is the anaphylactic. So one ml of epi from the one milligram per mil vial, you inject that into a 100 cc bag. Again, that's going to give you your dosing and then you can draw from that. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of work to make sure you've done it right, okay? now. Same thing is gonna happen with phenylephrine, the same kind of advice. Again, we're not gonna do ephedrine. And then I just wanna talk a little bit about this one, okay? So you've got, you've got a bag of norepinephrine. Your doc can draw some uh, solution from that and administer it because it's gonna be the right mixture. And the same with your vasopressin. But if you are drawing this from vials, you have to have a very particular protocol to follow. And I'm happy to share this chart with anybody who's interested. It's in the literature. It's a current article from 2022 in the pharmacy literature about how to give push dose vasopressors, how to make sure you're mixing them correctly, how to be sure that you're administering them correctly. And this is just a nice little visual. This is from EM Crit Doc. Uh, there's a wonderful blog site where they talk about mixing drips, just exactly what I've already told you about how to mix your drips, how to mix push dose phenylephrine, push dose epinephrine, how you draw that into the syringe. You can mix it into the bag or place it into the syringe itself. But you can see this offers a lot of possibility for human error. Now, basic reasons that we're going to use push dose vasopressors, we're going to use epi in post-cardiac arrest, heart failure, anaphylaxis, waiting for our vasopressors, or if we have bradycardia and hypotension, we can use push-dose epinephrine. Phenylephrine, we use periprocedure intraoperatively. And again, gonna use it only truly for patients who are in septic or anaphylactic shock. We're gonna use it, or neurogenic shock. 
sorry, not anaphylactic, sorry, neurogenic shock. So septic shock, neurogenic shock. So high quadriplegic injuries, C5 or above. And the patient already has mild to moderate to severe tachycardia. You're going to use phenylephrine as your push dose vasopressor. Norepinephrine right now is only considered usable and interoperative, but I'm seeing it being used in the ECC and in the ICU. And today I took a poll of my ICU doctors on a call. Nobody wanted to admit that they're doing push dose vasopressors, but they didn't say no. I said, are you using them? No comment, no comment, no comment. Okay, well, you know what that means. Yes, of course they are. And they're using norepinephrine. Some individuals may be using vasopressin right now. That's considered to have very limited utility, but I know that you might be using it in flight. You might use it in the ED. Maybe it's all you have. But at this point, the data shows that it's a relatively limited utility, except I would say in the case of a suspected or known severe metabolic acidosis. Okay, lots of studies, lots of discussion, lots of discussion today. Just came back from ENA where I did a talk on glucose management in the emergency department. And there were two big talks. I didn't go to either one because I didn't get there in time on high dose, on uh, push dose vasopressor and high dose vasopressor utilization in the ED to the ICU. So it is important to know this is coming to you. It might already be there as we saw by the poll, people are already doing push dose vasopressor. Don't really know if you have a policy, which means you're not protected. And looking at primary mixer of this is nursing. Okay, well, I, I believe nursing is better than having the physician and mix it. I really want the pharmacy to mix it. But if the holdup in the beginning is that you can't get your drip from the pharmacy, then having pharmacy mix it may not be a possibility. So we may have nurses who are mixing it. We need to assure that everybody knows how to mix it, that we have a pure protocol, that we have an identifier on the different doses of epinephrine that are available to us on our units so that we're doing it good and safely. So again, I just want to remind you, Drug number one, epinephrine. Alpha and beta increases contraction, vasoconstriction, uh, not it promotes coronary dilation, but it promotes vasoconstriction and it increases heart rate. Not used for patients who are already tachycardic or have any kind of tachydysrhythmia like a fib, a flutter, AV nodal reentry. Push dose epi has an onset of one minute and duration of five to 10. And those typical doses are five to 10 mics. Repeat it every two to five minutes till you achieve your hemodynamic goal up to 100. And then beyond that, you're not going to do any more. Okay. Phenylephrine, probably the most common choice. Pure alpha, pure alpha, arterial vasoconstrictor, has no direct chronotrope, no direct inotrope, but, and it's a beautiful option for people who are hypotensive and tachycardic. So heart rate above 100 and blood pressure low. However, it can actually cause some reflex bradycardia, which can be very concerning for us with those patients, has a rapid onset, longer duration of action, usually up to about 20 minutes. And we're going to give 50 to 200 mics repeated every two to five minutes to achieve a goal, up to typically 500 mics. Ephedrine, we're not going to use in the ED or the ICU. This is the one that I think most of us are most interested in, and that's norepinephrine has a much lower tendency to cause tachycardia or reduce the cardiac output at these lower doses. It's very potent alpha, very modest beta, induces vasoconstriction, brings that blood pressure up, and a mild increase in contractility without a significant increase in heart rate. Has a really rapid onset and a short duration of action. So if it was a mistake, it's going to be gone really fast. But nobody knows what the optimal dosing regimen is. Doses that are used during the OR, during vasoplegia, have ranged from three to 12 mics every one to two minutes based on the patient's response, but we don't have any evidence or knowledge how to use it in the ED or the ICU. That remains to be evaluated and tested. And it may be that you're testing this in a case study report or case study analysis in your own institution, in your ED, in your own practice, in conjunction with your physician colleagues. I can tell you here, I am seeing that we have physicians who are giving push dose norepinephrine to generate an increase in blood pressure. 
not because we don't have a norepinephrine drip, but because the patient's blood pressure has dropped so significantly that they're going to die if the blood pressure doesn't raise. So why do we use it and when? And select patients with shock, right? Shock, right? Patients who physiologically are going to infarct their brain or their heart or their kidney if we don't do something right now about their hypotension. It is really important to remember that if you have a known cause for the hypotension, treat the known cause. It really is the patient where you aren't certain about why they have this intermittent hypotension that you're gonna consider push dose vasopressor. It is really important to remind oneself there are three basic considerations here. I anticipate you're gonna drop your blood pressure like peri-intubation as a bridge while the drip is being mixed and the central line is being placed, et cetera, as a bridge to a continuous vasopressor drip. And if I am giving fluid, I am giving blood and I am giving vasopressor and I drop my blood pressure acutely, this is a temporizing way to maintain perfusion until you figure out what the problem is. So you can see it could be a really strong and effective adjunct into our therapeutic interventions. So a couple of quick take home points. The average time required to initiate a vasopressor infusion, even when you have an ED pharmacist, is eight minutes. And that's eight minutes where you may have a patient with severe, significant, life-threatening hypotension. You might be able to pull them back from the hypotension, but they've suffered eight minutes of hypotension. So push dose uh, push dose drugs are something that we should be discussing and considering and assuring, and I mean assuring, that you have a safe methodology for administration. Remember that if we just look categorically, phenylephrine is generally best for patients with hypotension who do not have bradycardia. So they have normal, normal, heart, normal sinus rhythm or mild tachycardia. Epinephrine is for patients who have hypotension bradycardia. So that's basically how that decision gets made. And always really important to remember that push dose pressors don't resolve the underlying clinical problem. It's just a bridge of symptom management. Very, very important to appreciate that most patients actually require continuous infusion of vasopressors after getting push dose because it's not a temporary event that's caused their hypotension. Typically, what we see when we give a push dose is that the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure goes up pretty significantly. So we had a patient in the ECC last week. Her systolic pressure dropped to 60. She got her physician, gave her a push dose of norepinephrine. Her pressure went up to 130, and it stayed there for about five minutes. We titrated her up from 15 up to 40 of norepinephrine, but her blood pressure did drop again. She got a second push dose and then she stabilized, but it took two push doses and titration norepinephrine up to 40 to stabilize her blood pressure. By the way, nobody thought she was gonna survive that day in the ED. She did survive. She went to the uh, ICU, the medical ICU. She actually survived. No one thought she was gonna survive. And I can't say it was the push dose, but seemed like that helped a little bit. Okay, so just remind ourselves that push dose vasopressors don't eliminate the need for fluids, don't eliminate the need for blood products, and don't necessarily eliminate the need for continuous IV infusion. But oftentimes what you will see is significant rebound to hypertension, tachycardia, or reflux bradycardia up to 30 minutes after you've administered your push dose therapy. So of course, really, really, really important is to try to involve your pharmacist. And I always like to remind you, any drip that depending on its dose acts on different receptor sites, we're going to call that dirty drugs. They're not really dirty. They're just multitaskers. Epinephrine is a multitasker. It's also known as dirty. It's dirty because depending on your dose, you're going to have different types of effects and you need to be sure you know what you're doing. Here are three really important references just that I'm adding in here that I thought were really important talking about predictor of hypotension for mortality, particularly in sepsis, terminal cardiovascular collapse. I thank you very much for joining today's Tuesday Topics. Really happy to share my slides, the references, and 
Very happy that you've been here today. Thank you for joining. And I'm going to say bye-bye for now. Hope to see you tomorrow on the final stage of unstable tachycardia, which is VTAC, multifocal VTAC, V flutter, and TDP. Thank you for joining. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.